The 2023 FIFA Women's World Cup will see the best footballers on the planet do battle. Spain star Jennifer Hermoso is one of the top goal scorers in women's football. While a pay dispute has overshadowed Canada's World Cup preparations. Immerse yourself in the biggest sporting event of the year with the contenders. A prolific goal scorer for club and country, Jennifer Hermoso's record speaks for itself. Capable of operating as an attacking midfielder or striker, Hermoso sits at the top of Spain's all-time leading scorers list. Hermoso scored 51 goals across all competitions in 2021, the most of any female player in the world to finish second in the Ballon d'Or behind Spain teammate Alexia Puteas. A five-time winner of the Pichichi Trophy for the most goals in a La Liga season, no player has scored more prolifically for Barcelona women than Hermoso, netting a club record 181 goals in 224 appearances, winning a plethora of silverware along the way. The Catalans completed a famous treble in 2021, with Hermoso firing her side to a maiden Champions League crown, scoring six goals to finish as the competition's joint top scorer. In June 2022, Hermoso announced her departure from Barcelona, signing for Mexican club Pachuca after a glorious second spell at Camp Nou. She won a total of 17 major trophies across two stints at the Spanish Giants, including five league titles. Hermoso will be forever remembered as a Barcelona legend. Spain teammate Mariona Caldente summed it up perfectly when describing Hermoso. She's got everything. She's pure magic. Hermoso's absence at Euro 2022 was a major blow to Spain's hopes of a breakthrough international triumph. One player Spain could ill afford to lose, a knee injury ruled her out of the tournament as La Roja bowed out at the quarterfinal stage. Hermoso scored 10 goals in Euro 2022 qualifying, underlining her importance to the team. She's an indispensable member of Spain's squad and will go down as one of the greatest players to ever wear the famous red shirt. But when it comes to international team success, Hermoso certainly has unfinished business. La Roja have never won a major women's trophy and the 2023 World Cup represents another opportunity for Spain to break that drought. And with Hermoso entering the twilight of her superb career, this could be her last chance to achieve World Cup glory. Up next, Canada are making their voices heard in their fight for equal pay. Since missing the inaugural Women's World Cup in 1991, Canada have qualified for the next eight editions of the tournament. They've made the knockout phase on three occasions, most recently in 2019, thanks to wins in their opening two group games. And spirits were understandably high in the Canadian camp. After a round of 16 exit at France 2019, Canada won gold at the Tokyo Olympics, beating Sweden on penalties to mark the nation's maiden triumph at a major world tournament. 
hard-fought victories over Brazil and two-time defending world champions the United States steeled Canada's resolve before edging the Swedes in a tight and tense final. And the Olympic champions will look to build on that success at the 2023 World Cup in Australia and New Zealand. But off the pitch, Canada are following the lead of their American counterparts and demanding equal pay. The Canadians threatened to go on strike over pay equity issues and budget cuts, wearing T-shirts displaying the words, enough is enough, in protest of their federation at February's She Believes Cup. The players say they were not paid at all in 2022, and funding cuts were drastically limiting their preparations for the 2023 World Cup. I think there's a few simple things that uh, need to be addressed with the CSA in terms of their transparency and their finances. That's a big one for us as the women's national team. We have no idea where the money, money is coming from, where it's going. Um, and the difference between the men's and, and women's national team program. Uh, and for us, the pay equity is actually like just a little piece of the yeah. puzzle. Um, it's, it's about equal treatment. It's about equal opportunities, equal resources. Um, and honestly, until that happens, yeah, we're gonna be at a stalemate. Christine Sinclair, the captain of the Canadian side, was particularly scathing in her assessment of Nick Bontis, the former president of Canada Soccer. Regular season goal number 51. On a personal note, I've never been more insulted than I was by Canada Soccer's own president, Nick Bontis, last year, as we met with him to discuss our concerns. I was tasked with outlining our compensation ask on behalf of the women's national team. The president of Canada Soccer listened to what I had to say, and then later in the meeting referred back to it as, quote, what was it Christine was bitching about? The trust between the two parties is at breaking point after players criticized Canada Soccer at a government hearing in March. We believe that what was talked about in good faith bargaining between our Players Association and the Association should have stayed between the Players Association and the Canadian Soccer Association. So we feel quite disrespected that it wasn't um, respected that it stayed behind closed doors before that agreement was actually signed. And there were terms and numbers and pieces of what was in their statement today that has not even been communicated to us. Um, so that was a bit of a shock to us, but we're again, we're excited to be here and, and to talk about um, this with you all. It's a less than ideal situation for Canada in a World Cup year, as they look ahead to Group B matches against co-hosts Australia, Nigeria and Ireland. I think when you play in a home nation, that's going to bring a great crowd atmosphere. Um, we've got recent experience against both Australia and Nigeria. And then Republic of Ireland, you know, you can't underestimate them. They, they drew with Sweden recently. Vera Powell's a great coach. Um, three different games, but I'm excited overall. Their match against the Matildas on July 31 in Melbourne could well determine who finishes top and who finishes second in Group B. I think we, we have to target top of the group. You can even cross over with England, you know, European champions in, in the, the round of 16. So I'm not assuming they'll win, but, you know, you've, you've got a great team there. Um, so absolutely, I think we've got to go in and, and look to win every game. Christine Sinclair has been a mainstay for Canada for over 20 years. The veteran midfielder is the all-time leading scorer in women's international football and has made over 300 appearances for her country. Sinclair is aiming to become the first player, male or female, to score its six World Cups, as Canada seeks more silverware in 2023. Moran sets up, driving through, and a gorgeous goal! It's a hat-trick for Christine Sinclair! After hosting the 2015 Women's World Cup, 
Canada's standing as a football nation was further boosted, announced as one of the co-hosts for the Men's World Cup in 2026. Canadian football is on the rise thanks to the Maple Leafs playing at a first World Cup in 36 years and the gold medal heroics of the nation's women's team at the Tokyo Olympics. For the 2026 FIFA World Cup, the member associations of Canada, Mexico and USA have been selected by the FIFA Congress to host the 2026 FIFA World Cup. Canada will become the fifth country to host both the Men's and Women's World Cup, joining Sweden, the United States, Germany and France. It's going to be huge for Canada. I mean, soccer is the number one played sport in our country, but now, like I said, these kids are not going to just want to play recreational. They're going to want to put on that jersey for the country because playing a World Cup at home changes the conversation. It, it makes your, your dreams that much more of a reality, and I think that's the shift we needed in, a, in the game in Canada and obviously in the U.S. and Mexico. And honestly, for, for CONCACAF, this is huge. Um, for the next generation, this is huge, and then, I mean, for me, this is huge. Uh, Canada, of course, uh, hosted the FIFA Women's World Cup um, just uh, two years ago. An enormously successful World Cup um, for the women, and uh, hosting in six Canadian cities across the country, and that legacy is uh, continuing um, both on and off the field. And by hosting the 2026 World Cup, Canadian football across all levels is set to benefit, including the women's game. You know, it is going to be the rocket fuel that will uh, elevate all of us, not just MLS, but the women's league and other pro leagues and everybody who loves the game. The World Cup brings the world together, as you'll see here in the next couple of days. And being an athlete and being able to play in a World Cup, that's one thing you know. It, it unites people. And I think that's what's excited about it. Politics aside, it's the biggest game in the world, and people are passionate about it, and that's what's going to bring people together. Coming up, a Women's World Cup blockbuster is coming to the Melbourne Rectangular Stadium. The 2023 Women's World Cup is sure to captivate Melbourne, a city that prides itself on being the sports capital of Australia. And the Melbourne Rectangular Stadium will be rocking when it hosts six World Cup matches throughout July and August. One of ten selected venues for the 2023 showpiece, the Melbourne Rectangular Stadium will stage four group stage games and two round of 16 clashes. And Melbournians are sure to flock to Australia's Group B blockbuster against Olympic champions Canada on July 31. Melbourne's first large purpose-built rectangular stadium is a uniquely built arena situated in the heart of the city's sports precinct. Opened in May 2010, it has a crowd capacity of just over 30,000 and features a cutting-edge bio-frame design with a geodesic dome roof and it's located within walking distance of Melbourne's Central Business District. Melbourne's premier rectangular sports venue offers an intimate atmosphere with not a single bad seat in the house. A-League clubs Melbourne Victory, Melbourne City and Western United all call the stadium home, while Rugby Union and Rugby League is also played at the venue. It played host to multiple matches at the 2015 Asian Cup, as well as two A-League Grand Finals. Fans attending Women's World Cup matches at the Melbourne Rectangular Stadium are in for a real treat. All the stadiums are easy to play in. It's the people in them that make it hard or not. <laughs> In Australia, we, had, we have a few grounds that are ovals, 
So when you set the field inside the oval, which is so far away from the crowd, um, that it's hard to feel the, the ambiance of it. Our rectangular stadiums are our best stadiums uh, in terms of players. Um, you might not have as many people there, but because they're so close to you, it does um, amp up the, the volume. The Melbourne Rectangular Stadium is going to be uh, the best. I'm a bit biased, though. Um, <laughs> you could probably say something in Sydney, but um, the Melbourne one is my favourite. You know, I love that it's such a, a poignant shadow in, in our landscape. Like, I love that you can drive past and, you know, my daughter always says that's where mummy works. There's so many sports in that little precinct uh, that it really showcases Melbourne as the you know, sporting hub of Australia. Some stadiums seem larger in terms of pitch-wise. Sometimes you walk into a stadium and you think, oh, that's big. And, you know, the nerves start to flutter. And then when the fans start to arrive, that's when we start to take notice of, of the things around us. I can tell you about a Mexican stadium that was terrible to play in, um, you know, in Guadalajara. And the, not only because of the amount of people in a rectangular stadium, because that's, you know, something like 90,000 people or more by now, um, but also it was above sea level. So, you, you know, you find it really hard to breathe. And, you know, at an alt altitude, all those things can come into play when you're playing and then the heaviness of the crowd as well against you. Um, yeah, when we played Mexico, it was a really tough stadium to play in. We used to have to worry about a lot of things, um, you know, especially if there was one game after the other. And certainly there was always a, an issue of equality because the men seemed to always get the good change rooms and even sometimes we were put out into portable change rooms because there weren't enough change rooms. But now those things have all been rectified. There's certainly a high level of, um, you know, professionalism and I think that makes a world of difference to any footballer walking into a stadium is how they feel when they walk into the change room, how good it looks, how clean it is, how, um, you know, up to date in the state-of-the-art technology? Are there TVs on the walls that the coaches can use? The elements of inclusion um, have been fantastic. So we have a sensory room in, in a lot of the stadiums for the kids that, and the parents and the people that can't always enjoy a game because of their auditory senses. And, um, and I feel like we're, we're just encompassing a lot more areas. When they turn up, they feel included and, and you know, there's a lot of accessibility and, you know, disabled uh, seats and, and viewpoints where everybody can watch the game and enjoy it. Still to come, Australia and New Zealand are preparing to co-host the biggest ever Women's World Cup. I can announce the host country of the FIFA Women's World Cup 2023, which will be Australia, New Zealand. Congratulations and thank you very much. The 2023 FIFA Women's World Cup in Australia and New Zealand will be groundbreaking in more ways than one. Not only will it be the first 32-team tournament, up from 24 in 2019, but it will mark the first time that a Women's World Cup will be jointly hosted by two countries. The FIFA Council has uh, already decided that as of 2023, as of the World Cup 2023, there will be 32 national teams participating instead of 24. So it will become even more global and having a much bigger positive impact on the development of women's football. Only once has a FIFA World Cup had more than one host, when Japan and South Korea jointly organized the men's tournament in 2002. The moment we got 
the tick of approval for knowing that we had the World Cup in Australia and New Zealand, it's just been an, an upward trajectory of excitement and it's something that is a once in a lifetime opportunity in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, so we're, we're really, really looking forward to that. It will also be the first to be held in the Southern Hemisphere when Australia and New Zealand welcome the world to their shores for the month long event. The Women's World Cup in 2023 is certainly an important milestone for us. The fact that it will be played for the first time in the Southern Hemisphere, in, in uh, the Asia Pacific region, across two confederations, is an important uh, element of this development as well. But we need to develop it all over the world. So Australia and New Zealand will play an important part in this, but the entire world and FIFA will work together in this respect. The Women's World Cup is not the first major sporting event the Trans-Tasman neighbours have co-hosted. Australia and New Zealand shared the hosting duties of the 1987 Rugby World Cup and the 2015 Cricket World Cup. But hosting the world's biggest women's sporting event represents a whole new challenge. One of the, one of the questions raised or, or comments made in the evaluation report was, uh, it is a challenge across co-hosting, you know, of countries. Uh, but I think what we have demonstrated through the Rugby World Cup, the Cricket World Cup, that we have done these events before. Uh, so we are, we're well placed to manage it across confederations as well as across different countries. I think Australia and New Zealand can put hand on heart and say, we've got a strong track record of delivering uh, world-class events and this bid can certainly do that in the short time frame that now exists before the tournament. The ninth edition of the Women's World Cup will also be the first FIFA tournament, men's or women's, to be staged in two confederations. Asia and Oceania will come together to stage the women's global showpiece with a record total of 64 matches to be played across nine cities in Australia and New Zealand. We've put forward a bit of firsts. Firsts between two confederations, first in the Southern Hemisphere and a first Women's World Cup in the Asia-Pacific region. At the core of the bid is great infrastructure, strong commercials, player-centric, and more importantly, a strong legacy for women and the girls in our community for Australia, New Zealand, and the whole of Asia and the Pacific. Australia and New Zealand will welcome a massive influx of fans from around the world for this historic Women's World Cup. With 1.5 million fans projected to attend matches at the 2023 World Cup, Australia and New Zealand are confident they have everything in place to co-host a memorable tournament. It's going to be an incredible start for the FIFA Women's World Cup this year. We of course have the opening match and the opening ceremony in Auckland where the New Zealand football ferns will take on Norway. And then a few hours later across the ditch we're going to have the Matildas playing against the Republic of Ireland. Two absolutely massive matches and we're expecting over 100,000 fans to fill those two stadiums and take in that momentous moment which will be the opening day of the Women's World Cup. Together with New Zealand football, with FIFA, with our great support from government, with our member federations such as Football New South Wales, we do truly believe that we will deliver the best Women's World Cup of all time.